or something statewide like the redistricting or yeah, nonpartisan or commission. I think so, yeah. My wife and I just moved to Miamisburg, actually. Oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> Our old house there. Eighteen ninety six. Oh, really? Aren't you closer to Miamisburg than that? I think it's a little bit closer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, just a couple weeks ago. Nice, look at that. You like my so far? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we love it. Yeah. Gotcha. Did you see Miami's bird? Miami's bird, yeah. Did you, they uh, really doing some cool things yeah. at the Miami River Trail. Yes. Which runs right mm -hmm. through there. Mm -hmm. I've gone to a conference about regarding that. It's pretty neat. <coughs> yeah, their riverfront park is yeah. recently revamped. Yeah. It's really super nice. I saw the plans. That looks really cool. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah good time to, to move there. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> I think so. That's you. Hi, I'm Chad. Nice to meet you. Okay, nice, nice to meet you. Here they come. Yeah, good to see you. We're not at a kid's birthday party. In yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. For <laughs> official capacity. <laughs> <All right. laughs> That clock is fast, so you guys are you're good. We were out there, but we thought the door was closed. I yeah, I did that too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess it was only just one for the record, we weren't late. I suppose. <laughs> Docking your pay. Right? We'll go ahead and call to order the um, Board of Zoning and Appeals for the City of Oxford, Tuesday, August 27th. We will um, begin with an election of officers and swearing in new BZA members. Support the Constitution of the United States and of the state of Ohio. And the state of Ohio. And will obey the laws thereof. And will obey the laws thereof. And that I will, in all respects. And I will, in all respects. Uphold and enforce the provisions of the charter. Uphold and enforce the provisions of the charter. And ordinances of the city of Oxford. And ordinances of the city of Oxford. And will faithfully discharge the duties. And will faithfully discharge the duties of the Board of Zoning Appeals of the city of Oxford. Board of Zoning Appeals of the City of Oxford. Upon which I am a member. Upon which I am a member. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then I'll sign yours after we swear you in. Okay. Awesome. Like Same thing. <laughs> Sounds good. I. I. Say your name. Balzinium Dash Storch. Solemnly swear. Solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And of the State of Ohio. And of the State of Ohio. Obey the laws thereof, and will obey the laws thereof, and that I will in all respects, and that I will in all respects, uphold and enforce the provisions of the charter, uphold and enforce the provisions of the charter, and ordinances of the city of Oxford, and ordinances of the city of Oxford, and will faithfully discharge the duties, and will faithfully discharge the duties of the board of zoning appeals of the city of Oxford, of the board of zoning appeals of the city of Oxford, upon which I am a member, upon which I am a member. Okay. Congratulations. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much. Wait till these are executed. Is that okay? I have copies here. I'll sign. I believe so. Yes, and then I think they sign and they sign. Okay.
Okay, welcome. Um, next item would be in the absence of a chair and a vice chair, the remaining members must elect a chair pro term to lead this meeting. I move to elect Mr. Smith. I second. So moved. Or I, yeah, yep. no, no doubt. Uh, roll call is okay. Um, motion carries. And I accept the responsibility of Chair Pro Tem for the remainder of the meeting. Okay. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, we do need to elect officers as well um, for the board. And do anyone have, does anyone have a nomination for the Office of Chair for the Board of Zoning and Appeals? Second. second. So you can um, accept um, nominations or other nominations? Or? Yeah, if, if everybody, so yeah, if, if everybody's in favor of that, you can do a roll call vote. If, you, if somebody wants to nominate somebody else, you can nominate somebody else. So you can ask if anybody else has anybody it, else to nominate, otherwise you can move forward with roll call vote. Is it important to, to, um, to state the, the member not? present or I know we have a quorum but yeah you, you would vote without that member present okay sure well I will um, <laughs> um, do it do I have to accept the I oh, okay you, you don't have to accept um, if, you, if you want to nominate somebody else and then there can be there can be a you know a vote on yeah uh, some on alternative mm -hmm. or... yeah I think I would um, decline the nomination while appreciative and nominate um, the current vice chair who's not present, uh, Mr. Russo, as chair. And then you do a roll call vote. A, a roll First call. Vote, get a second. Get a second. I have a second. Second. Okay. Second. And a roll call vote. Okay. okay. On, which, on which motion? Um, on, on what on you Mr. just Smith's motion. Yes, yeah, on, on the new motion to, um, so I decline the, I, did, I decline the nomination. Okay. Um, and instead make a motion to elect uh, Mr. Russo as chair of the Is there a second? Second. Mr. Russo. Okay, roll yep. call. And is it Dash Dorge? Am I pronouncing that right? That's right. Yep. Mr. Dash Dorge? Aye. Mr. Wyatt? Aye. Mr. Chafin? Yes. Is it Aye. Chaffin or Chafin? Chaffin. Chaffin, Mr. Chaffin? Aye. And Mr. Smith? Aye. have a chair now we now have a chair congratulations to mr. Russo uh, <laughs> that's right story as old as time um, second up uh, would be the nomination for a vice chair for BZA does anyone have mr. Smith nominate mr. Smith second you accept that this was a I, I do indeed accept uh, the nomination okay. for vice <laughs> vice uh, okay. chair yes second okay. roll call roll call Mr. Dash Dorge? Aye. Mr. Wyatt? Aye. Mr. Chaffin? Yes. Mr. Aye. Smith? I accept, yes. Yes, aye. All right. Okay. So we now have a chair and a vice chair for BZA. Next um, officer to elect would be secretary for the Board of Zoning and Appeals. Any nominations? I'll nominate Mr. Chaffin. Yeah. Can I ask a question? What is that role? We have someone here taking minutes, right? Would I be taking minutes or anything? Or so um, the, the staff will be responsible for the minutes. Um, the role of the secretary, I would say, is, is probably more ceremonial in nature. Um, it would just be an individual who um, maybe takes a greater responsibility in looking over the minutes to ensure their accuracy okay. when they're being approved at the following meeting. Yeah, I'll take, I'll accept that. Thank you. Okay. I second. Okay. Roll call. Roll call. Mr. Dash Dorge? Aye. Mr. Wyatt? Aye. Mr. Chaffin? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Smith? I know if I have a conflict, I hope myself. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> We've now elected a uh, secretary. Okay. And that's the end of that business. I believe we can move on now to the approval of the April 23rd regular meeting minutes. Anybody have any comments or questions regarding those? Steve. I have. 
question about, there was a case pending at that meeting, 202401, is that correct, Zach? I'm sorry, there was a question about at, a pending case. At that meeting the, on April 23rd, there was a case pending, 202401. Yes, Under so new business. that case continues to be voluntarily postponed. Um, I believe this one is waiting on a full board. Is that correct, Mr. Webb? Can, can I ask, how long has this case been pending? Um, it's been a while. Um, I don't recall the first meeting. Do you recall, Mr. Webb? Maybe one more month, we'll be ready to get that resolved. Okay. One or six. Thank you. I move to approve the minutes. So moved. Yep. Second. Okay. And um, roll call. Roll call or? Yeah, roll call for approving the minutes. Okay. Mr. Dash George? Aye. Mr. Wyatt? Aye. Mr. Chaffin? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Okay, we will move on to new business. That's BZA 2024-02-131 Willow Lane variance to section 114906, limit to front yard parking. And just a reminder, Mr. Vice Chair, I do need to be sworn in before I give my testimony to the board. Yes, uh, yes, of course. Um, please state your name for the record. Zachary Moore, I'm the city planner and GIS coordinator for the city of Oxford, Ohio. And you do solemnly swear to uh, tell the truth and the whole truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. That will do. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Okay, so our one case of the evening, this is BZA 2024 02. This is a single variance requested for 131 Willow Lane. And the applicant is Scott Webb, architect. The property owner is a Mr. Ken Kist, who recently acquired the property in question. The zoning classification, oh, something wrong with the chair. One moment. There we go. To apologize about that. But I would love for the board to be able to see the slides that have been prepared. <laughs> okay, let's try this again. <laughs> so as I said, the applicant is Scott Webb. Property owner is Mr. Ken Kist. The zoning classification applicable to the property, it's an R3MS single two and three family mile square residential district. The current use of the property, it's a single family dwelling. And the proposal, it's a single variance to a single section of code. This is out of 1149.06B1, front yard parking. And if this variance were approved tonight, this would clear the way for a possible conversion from single family to two family. Um, and I will note that both of these land uses are permitted uses in the R3 MS district. Um, the three essentially denotes that the maximum you can go is a three family dwelling, so that'd be three units to a structure. So essentially a triplex would be the max you could build. Um, what this property owner and this applicant are intending to eventually put forward is a proposal for a two family. 
And here is a look at the location of the property. So this is an aerial view that's included in your packet. And there's actually three different parcels that correspond to this single property. And as you can see, the structure is straddling at least two of those parcels. So um, these white lines here are delineating parcel boundaries. And we are aware that the owner does intend on consolidating all of these parcels together uh, to form a single site. And um, that is necessary because of the parking setback conflicts that would result um, by leaving them alone, essentially. So uh, it's essentially grandfathered in at present with the building over top of the property line because normally you cannot have buildings encroaching across property lines. Um, so just some added context there for the board. This is on Willow Lane, which is a public street, and it is a corner lot. So Willow is to the north, and North Campus is on the east. And then here is a look at the zoning classifications in the area. So essentially, it's all zoned the same way. It's all an R3 MS zoning designation, three-family district. And here are some recent site photos taken by our code enforcement officer. These were taken on August 22nd, so pretty recently. And uh, I guess I would call that a ranch style house. Uh, we'll see what the architect has to say, but um, uh, yeah, predominantly a, a one story a type of layout, but there are, uh, there is a, at least an attic space, I would say, um, up above here where it is being contemplated to add a second unit to the property. Um, there is a two car attached garage with a driveway, a double wide driveway that leads to that garage. And so that is really the subject of this hearing tonight is um, observing that driveway for compliance with the minimum off street parking requirements. And here is a bird's eye view of the property. Um, we can refer back to this if needed, but this is just offering a different perspective should we need it. Okay. So um, looking to the relevant zoning provisions, so this is out of, again, 1149.06.B1, and it provides the following language. So this is straight out of our zoning code. It specifies one parking space may be located in a required front yard all other parking spaces required or provided in excess of the minimum shall not be located in the required front yard. The reason that we're looking to this provision is that whenever you have a change of use, like for instance in this situation we're changing the use from single family to two family, you have to come into conformance with the current parking requirements. And because of that, we're looking to a number of sections, this section included, which specifies um, no more than one parking space being in that required front yard. And so the request at hand is to more or less double the restriction from one parking space to two. And um, just a note of clarity here on how staff has interpreted the term required front yard. We've always interpreted that as the area falling within the front yard setback, which is a minimum di uh, distance specified for each and every zoning district. And I do apologize, the staff report was an error. It's mentioned that this distance was 20 feet, which is true for R1 and R2 MS, but in R3, it's a little bit different. It's actually a minimum of 15. So the true front yard setback and required front yard area is 15 feet. But with respect to the variance, it doesn't really change the equation all that much. It's just a difference of five feet. And here is a look at the submitted property survey. So this is showing the existing condition of the property. So we don't have any detailed plans as of yet in terms of how exactly the interior of this structure might be altered to accommodate a two family setup um, because this is really um, more in a, in a proactive or preemptive status at the moment because the applicant and the owner are trying to understand whether they can actually proceed with the ability to do the two families. So they're not going to spend the money and the time developing out the plans as to exactly what would happen internally with the structure um, pending this, this board's decision. 
but looking at the details for this particular variance, so the front yard setback zone, so that's that 15 foot area. And because this is a corner lot, there are two front yards measured. One is measured from Willow, which is where, of course, the front door is presently located. The other is measured from North Campus Avenue. So effectively, everything in orange is that front yard setback zone. And then I've outlined the four parking spaces in red. So the code specifies for a two-family use, you must have at least four off-street parking spaces provided on the property itself. You cannot count on-street spaces. Certainly on-street spaces will help to satisfy some of that demand that's created. Um, but in terms of off-street parking, the minimum that the code provides for is four. So in trying to demonstrate that the minimum of four is met, we're showing two existing spaces in the attached garage. And those are fine, of course. Those are clear of the front yard. But the two on the driveway, you can see overlap with that front yard setback zone. And the code only allows for one of those spaces to overlap by right. In order to have a second one overlap, necessitates the variance. So going through the decision criteria, uh, I think what I'll do is I'll just read through the commentary one by one. There's not too much in this situation. Sometimes this tends to be one of the beefier sections of the report. Uh, essentially what the board has to do, and uh, this is per state case law in Ohio, uh, Duncan v. Middlefield, it's a 1986 case that specified what we refer to as the Duncan standards. So that's where these standards come from. A through G. Uh, so what the board is tasked with doing is finding whether practical difficulties exist which would render strict application of the code unreasonable. And in determining whether the practical difficulty standard is met, the board must reference these criteria. So staff provides the analysis of each of these criteria and then um, the board can answer questions of staff and the applicant, and then you would be free to deliberate in terms of weighing these various criteria to determine whether practical difficulties has been demonstrated. So starting with criterion A, which is whether the property in question will yield reasonable return or whether there can be any beneficial use of the property without the variance, we as staff find this does not support the variance. Um, we conclude concur with the applicant's assessment on this criterion, the owner may continue to see a financial return on the status of the property as a single family. So because there's an economic benefit to the property absent the variance, we find that A is not, uh, is not lending any support toward, toward the variance. That's essentially what we've concluded with A. Criterion B is whether the variance is substantial. We believe this supports the variance. The applicant is asking to double the maximum number of spaces allowed in the front yard. In some situations, this may be considered substantial, especially for instances where you've got lots with narrower frontage and where the lot only fronts on one street. But in this situation, given the facts and circumstances, um, and we do all these case by case, uh, given the greater degree of frontage along the lot, uh, along the two public streets, Willow and North Campus, there's a greater prevalence of green space than usual. And so for this reason, we do not find that the variance is substantial. Criterion C is whether the essential character of the neighborhood would be substantially altered. I think this one's pretty straightforward. The driveway already exists and it will remain. So the neighborhood character will more or less be unaltered if the variance were granted. So we find that this supports the variance. D is whether the variance would adversely affect the delivery of governmental services. We find that this supports the variance and what we often rely upon in our staff reports um, is uh, comments from department heads. So we, for every variance request, every appeal request, we would um, consult our fire chief, our police chief, and our city engineer to see if they have any concerns about what's being proposed and the city engineer and the fire chief 
they looked over the application. They didn't see anything that was worthy of commenting on, any concerns, so they returned it without comments. That's a common response from, from um, our department heads. Uh, the, po the police chief did ask that the property owner ensure the garage continues to be utilized for vehicle storage and not for any other use. And by doing so, this will s certainly lessen the demand pressure on the nearby public streets. So overall, we find that it supports the variance, D supports the variance. Criterion E, uh, where I ultimately landed on this, um, at, at this time, I'm not sure there's enough evidence in the record to say one way or another. So for the time being, we're just saying that it does not support, it does not lend any additional support toward granting the variance. Uh, the applicant could certainly provide some additional context to that, but uh, just going off what was stated in the narrative letter, the property owner was not initially aware of the zoning restriction, which is currently under scrutiny. Letter F is whether the owner's predicament feasibly can be obviated through some method other than a variance. We find this also supports the variance. So if we're viewing the predicament here as the ability to establish a two-family use, uh, technically, there is an avenue where you could co achieve compliance, but it involves far more significant alteration to the subject lot, far more disturbance. Because what you would have to do is demolish the building, either a full demolition or even partial demolition, to create a brand new parking area that would otherwise conform with the zoning requirements and the front yard restriction among them. Uh, but we feel that mandating such lengths being taken for the sake of this standard would uh, be extreme. And for that reason, we find that F supports the variance. G is the spirit and intent behind the requirement being observed and justice being done. So uh, unfortunately, we don't have an annotated version of our zoning code that goes in depth about the specific purposes and goals behind each and every zoning standard. So. I think what I could offer the board is my professional perspective on what this standard, along with other standards, is trying to achieve. So I believe that the supposed intent of this restriction is to maintain a reasonable portion of green space between structures and the public realm of the street, where you have the street itself, sidewalks, and so forth, uh, such that the urban environment is not getting overtaken by cars and paved surfaces. So owners are not permitted to pave their entire front yard, more or less. Um, that's not good for impacts such as runoff. It's not good aesthetically for the neighborhood. A variety of reasons why we wouldn't want to see that happen. So the code is generally discouraging wide expanses of pavement in fronts of lots through a number of provisions. Not only this parking restriction under scrutiny tonight, but also standards such as max driveway width, which is normally 18 feet. I think this one's grandfathered in at about 20. And max front yard coverage, which is normally 25% max. And this meets that coverage standard no problem because again, it's a corner, so there's lots of green space. In this particular situation, um, these other standards are being met or otherwise close to being met. So we believe acknowledging the current condition and clearing the way for permissible use would be doing substantial justice. And then finally, we've reached the bottom of the slide. <laughs> Criterion H is any other relevant factor, and we do believe there's other factors that support approval. And this includes the existence of the driveway in question. It's already there. We can already see what the impact would be. No change to neighborhood impressions. The pre-existing nature of the interior layout is conducive to divided units. So this is a strange one in that there is actually a second door uh, just to the right of the main front door if you're looking at the house from Willow. And that leads up to a stair, which leads up to the second floor area. This has never been recognized as a second unit, at least according to the records that I've seen. Um, so this would be changing what the use is on paper, but it does appear that this structure has some of the bones that it would take in order to facilitate the separation um, of the units. And then finally, there are a number of goals and values that are expressed in our comprehensive plan that we adopted last year. 
And uh, one of those is objective L3 to promote development and redevelopment in targeted areas and to favor infill development. And this is definitely at a very granular level when it comes to infill. We're talking about one additional unit. Um, but I still think it's relevant because it's allowing for um, some of that demand for, and it's no secret, we know this is going to be used for student housing. And there's certainly student housing pressures with any college town, ours included. So um, to me, this is helping to facilitate that infill development pattern that the plan stresses is important. And that is about all I have to say about this case, and I'm happy to take any questions from the board. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Are there any questions for Mr. Moore? I have many questions. <clears throat> Just for the record. <clears throat> I'm so sorry, Mr. Chief. Um, so, uh, Glenn, could you put up the slide? Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm so sorry, Mr. Chaffin. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, just for the record, you and I have talked many times about this. I've asked many questions. I've done, I hope, my research on this because I don't want to come here unprepared. So, one of the things I want to ask you about is a, a sketch that you gave me. And I don't know if we should enter this in the record, Mr. Chairman, or not. I can show the other board members. Uh, we certainly can review it. It's a sketch, and Zach, to clarify this, was a sketch you had given to me, is that correct? Yes. And it was on file in your office? Yes. So it's, I guess, considered an official record? Yes. Okay. And it, it, the way I look at it, that above the garage unit is a livable unit. Would that be a fair, according to the sketch? It's got a kitchen, bathroom, the whole bit. Is that correct? You want to so, look at it again? Or? Um, I think I, I don't have the um, so we have a, a database at our office that communicates when units have been inspected who's inspected them whether there were any um, codes that were out of compliance at the time of inspection I'm not able to hear on the record uh, confirm the livability of that space but certainly um, you can see that it's um, I'm, if I'm recalling correctly, it's labeled as living space. There is a kitchen labeled. Yes. And there's um, a living area labeled, and I believe there's a bathroom Correct. as well. Correct. Labeled. So certainly, those are all components to any you know viable dwelling space. So it, it indicates on the sketch it was inspected on November 24th, 1993. Yes, and so some of the context behind that. So. Um, we had an employee at the time, his name was Jim Kimbrough, and he did a variety of sketches for units in town that he inspected. Um, it was more or less realized at one point or another that um, the inspection should not only entail just a visual observation, but there needed to be some kind of a record as to what was contained within the insides of residential structures, what the layouts were, where the bedrooms were, um, how big they were, whether there was a kitchen, where it would be, those various aspects needed to be recorded. Is it fair um, to say that he, he wouldn't have sketched this if this didn't actually exist? Would that be fair to say? I suppose that's fair to say. Uh, <laughs> Mr. If, Chairman, uh, could I make this sketch part of the record, please? Sure. Thank you. Uh, whatever exhibit you want to call it. Um, so do we, excuse me, do we need a motion to um, put this in as an exhibit? in the packet or in the meeting minutes rather uh, you you don't need a formal motion I think unless there's any objection from okay. applicants or from staff you can go ahead and just include it so we'll add a copy of this to the meeting minutes thank you sir. so and, and you also indicated when we're going to the factors that the owner had knowledge of the, the zoning and the restrictions with respect to the parking barriers correct I would um, defer to the applicant for specifics on okay. that. So certainly, uh, but you that's put a great that in your question report that you, that post you believe he did when his time I mean, comes. That was your part of your recommendation that he had knowledge of it. Yeah, that's what I was recalling at the time. I just I don't know whether in my off the cuff remarks whether that was completely accurate. So again, I would I would rely upon um, Mr. Webb to okay. speak to that. Do you, do you have any knowledge based on what you? talk to the applicant or anyone if he knew about this sketch or if he's inspected the property with respect to the upstairs unit I don't have any personal knowledge of any of that okay um, so one of the issues is is a so-called predicament 
and I want to know what information you have about that. You've talked about the cost of demolition and whatever. Are, is there, has there been any discussion about this at all, what he would have to do to get compliant without the variance? Well, that's just, um, I, I'm observing that on its face. So I'm looking at what has been submitted by the applicant at face value, and then I'm offering my um, professional judgment and expertise as to what I feel is reasonable given the situation. So I don't certainly have anything that is more concrete in terms of dollar figures and you know how much more expensive it might be to you know otherwise rework this property to fully comply with the code requirements but sure. I think it's it's certainly fair to say that it would cost a lot more to do that versus leaving the structure as is so. well, well then for the record though just in terms of what evidence we have we don't really have any evidence about that is that, is that fair to say well the evidence is being provided in the form so you've got the materials in the packet you've got the staff report, the testimony that I have given and that Mr. Webb will give, and so that is the evidence that you would be using to come to the, the best determination that you can. But it doesn't specify about the predicament or significant cost at this point. We don't really have evidence on that, do we? I guess I, I'm, I'm wondering what sort of evidence you might For example, be a cost in. estimate, a plan, or something that's been reviewed so we could say, okay, yeah, he's met the he's met that threshold of being in this predicament that the variance would be necessary. Well, so the, the, the job is really, so this is one criterion among many sure. in terms of, and this, as I mentioned, it comes from the state case law, the Duncan v. Middlefield case, and that's the language that it uses. Um, it talks about the predicament at hand and um, whether it can be met in some other way that doesn't necessitate the variance. So to me, the predicament at hand is the notion of converting the use, to change the use from single family to two family. Um, if the variance weren't successful, then that would render uh, effectively that the only viable land use would be the existing land use at that moment, which would be the single family. Um, and per criterion A, we're finding that, you know, there's, there's certainly economic benefit there. We're not depriving any and all economic benefit by, um, if, if the decision was to deny the variance, it wouldn't be depriving all economic benefit. But certainly there would be more economic benefit if the variance were granted. Um, but um, again, kind of going back to the point I made earlier, which is, so, two family as well as three family are still permissible land uses. So it's not like this is a, a completely you know, wild idea that somebody has in mind to do to, to improve their property, to um, put it into a higher and better use than it presently is. You know, those are very normal things that property owners can consider doing, but in order for them to proceed down that particular path necessitates us being here tonight. Just a couple more, I'm sorry. So I think in discussions we've had, and I think even today, you've, you've mentioned that this is kind of unlocking the door to a, a multifamily use, correct? Well, I wouldn't call it a multifamily by definition. So it's true that it's multiple units. So in that sense, I guess you could call it multifamily. Um, but by definition, anything greater than three is multifamily, according to zoning, as well as the state building code too. And just for the record, our code defines family as four occupants. So if we grant the variance, and if he goes and converts it to a two-family residence, we could have eight occupants. Is that up, up to eight is the possible, the maximum possible under the zoning definition. There are other limiting factors, as we, we discussed, yeah. um, out of our property maintenance code. Um, maximum bedroom size at 70 square feet per person. Um, so the number of bedrooms and the size of those bedrooms can influence the ultimate number that would result. And do we know what that would be? Because according to the sketch, there's only two bedrooms and one, up, one upstairs. We have not done that analysis at present. Um, we don't know part of this would be also waiting for that future floor plan so that that review can be done. We, have, we don't have any idea. We've got no plans from the owner. Not presently. We don't have 
we all we have at this moment in terms of floor plan would be what's on file. One last thing. Okay, you talked about the other factors in a comprehensive plan could be looked at. I've looked at the comprehensive plan. Isn't it true that the comprehensive plan does call for mixed use in this in this zoning classification? Single family and two family, three family. It so calls for a mix of housing types. Yes. Would it be reasonable to say, maybe other board members would agree or not agree, that there is a shortage or a continuing assault on single family homes being converted in the square mile area? that a reasonable thing to say? I'm not sure I would want to speak to that. What you're getting at there is um, more of a legislative concern in terms of setting policy, um, which that job is primarily um, associated or attributed to the Planning Commission and to the City Council. Uh, City Council is the authority that accepts changes to the uh, ordinances to legislation. So. What we're operating under here, and so the scope of BZA is, is actually quite narrow in comparison because you're going by the existing law, and the existing law specifies that one family, two family, and three family are permitted uses in this district, provided that the code standards can be complied with. Duncan does allow us to consider substantial justice, which would include the community's concern, such as the comprehensive would that be fair? Um, the substantial justice criterion to me has not always applied to the, to me that's always referenced the, the applicant or the property owner in question. Um, the, the comp plan, I've always uh, tied that more to criterion H into the, the catch all criterion at the end because to me, the substantial justice is being done for the applicant who's requesting the variance. Could I read Whether or not justice is, is needed could in the could situation. Could I read from the Duncan decision? Substantial justice required the interest of the community, neighborhood, and joining property owners be given due consideration. And they, in fact, affirmed the variance denial in that case, just for the record. So I'm done, thank you. Can I have something to add? Just, so just elaborate a little bit. And these are all really good questions, of course. So. Um, and, and I know you know this uh, based on what you've indicated, but you know, Duncan, um, you know, the intent behind Duncan is you're weighing all these criteria, as you know. Um, and this is maybe a little bit of a background just in general for the, for the board members, especially the new board members, but um, you're, you're, all the evidence that you're receiving from, from Zach and from the testimony, the staff report, the PowerPoint slides, those are all evidence from the applicant, the applicant's testimony evidence that the applicant wants to introduce. Um, and then you're assessing a way to that evidence. And then you're gonna determine, right, you know this, um, which one of these criteria are met. Uh, and you're weighing all these criteria. Not one, not one single criteria is determinative or controlling, but you're looking at this in a totality of circumstances um, and really focusing on the criteria. There is a criteria on H that allows you to consider any other factor, as you mentioned, and also criteria G allows you to consider the spirit and intent of the zoning code. Um, but these other criteria, of course, are, are very specific and, and well-defined. So, um, you know, when you consider each of these applications in general, um, you, you want to consider them on their face and less, consider less so other properties, other applicants, other things that you've heard about in the past, um, and maybe other, other larger concerns that you have, right? So you're really focused on, these, on this specific case and these specific criteria and the evidence that you're hearing from the applicant and staff on these criteria. Okay, I don't know if that's helpful at all, but that's just a little bit of a, a primer just in general. And not one of those criteria is more important than the other. It's, Correct. Yes. Correct. It's, yeah. And typically you will kind of look at the weight of the evidence and the weight of you know which criteria support or do not support the applicant's request. But generally speaking, no, no one criteria is more important than any other criteria, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Moore? Yeah, I had a quick question actually. Um, so based on my reading of the, the report and the materials provided, it seems to be a parking question, right, of turning the single parking into, and counting it as two parking spots. Is, are you aware of anything in the zoning or the code that says a single family can't have more than five cars? Or it seems conceivable to me that even if we did nothing, or that a single family could get in there and have six, seven, eight cars, and what, what's your, uh, what's some background on that? Sure, so these requirements for off-street parking spaces are minimums in the code. 
So Got it. The, the owner is always free to add more parking if it's feasible to add it. Got it. And many often do or have properties that do provide more than the minimum. So you can have single family homes that say provide four parking spaces instead of the minimum of two. Um, so uh, we do have actually maximum parking standards, but it's for commercial use. I see. So, but for residential, it's um, there's no maximum. It's just you meet the minimum, and as long as you stay within the other parameters, I think the the other standard that would be um, limiting to that would be our max lot coverage, which in the MS districts is 45 percent. Got it. So, in essence, by controlling the amount of surface area or footprint area of structures you can have on your lot is going to, by its very nature, control how much more parking you can add on the right. lot above but and beyond the minimum. Got it. There's no maximum. There's no maximum. Someone could have- Not eight. in residential. Right. They could have eight tiny cars if they wanted, right? <laughs> well, there's a minimum size to each parking space. I see. Okay. Nine by 18. Got it. Okay. <laughs> I have Thank a question you. on just the kind of the practicality of this kind of kind of home and the parking because I agree with all the recommendations completely. I just look at my, thinking of myself as a as someone that's going to be that would live there. You have two you have two cars that would be parked in the garage. Two they're going to be parked behind it in the driveway. How in the world would, is that even doable? And people come in and go in at different times, different schedules. So I believe the front of the house, the street, will be used for most of the parking all the time. So what are the rules that we have if we have more of these homes that are going to be converted uh, you know, to multifamily or not multi, but two, two residents within one? Um, we approve these things, and then most of the folks park out um, in the street. What are, what are the rules with parking in front of homes here in Oxford? How many, so, how many is too much? So you're, you're getting into um, policy questions okay. with that. And um, those are well, very a much. Rule. Is there a rule, though? I mean, is it there? A, 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 well, the rules for parking, where you right? can park yeah. on the street, um, in terms of which zones are, are yellow zone and which are free for on-street parking, that is outside of the auspices of zoning. That's mm -hmm. more um, under. I believe it's actually the city manager who oversees that in conjunction with the police department, the parking division. Um, possibly also to some extent, and I'm just speculating here, so just clarifying for the record. I don't know this for a fact, but I'm just specifying that there, there would probably be multiple voices in that, uh, in that overall, uh, on that subject in terms of which, which streets should allow parking on one side versus two sides, and, and those policies, there's a way for those policies to change, but I, I just don't have a, a front row seat to exactly how that, mm -hmm. that functions. But yeah, as I said, it's outside of the scope of zoning, but certainly it's all one system, right? So there's some practical uh, reasons to consider, you know, the relationship between and the dynamic between off-street parking and on-street parking because a vehicle's a vehicle and it's gonna wanna find, the person driving it is gonna wanna find, you know, the closest parking spot to wherever it is that they're trying to reach their home, um, going shopping and so forth. Um, so, but, but getting, getting down into the details in terms of, you know, the number of parking spaces that we're going to require, when they're gonna become subject to those requirements, um, in terms of, you know, based on the, the scale of the improvement to property, so is there a certain threshold where more parking might be required? Um, you know, those, those are getting, those aspects are getting into more of the, the policy discussions that would happen with the Planning Commission and ultimately Council. Um, but I would be remiss to say that we're not, uh, we, we are um, very much open to that dialogue or are going to be open to that dialogue because we are going to be starting very soon a major overhaul to our planning and zoning code, part 11 of the codified ordinances. So we, the city organization, city councils approved um, a consultant to help us with that endeavor mckenna associates out of kalamazoo michigan will be helping us to modernize and update our zoning standards so a lot of those standards could very much be you know part of that that uh, that overall you know overview and overhaul of the of the codes but with existing off the street parking 
there's virtually no mechanism for enforcement so at this point so and out of our scope in yeah, this somebody's conversation. parking yeah. in an area where they shouldn't be if they're parking there's no, yeah, there's um, no. off the pavement right. um, if they're parking in a front yard that's not paved over there's that becomes an enforcement matter at that correct point. well thank you any other questions for mr moore hearing none thank you for your uh, report thank you <clears throat> um the applicant would like to approach could you have him put my uh, slide back up uh, glenn yep very good thank you <laughs> okay please state your name for the record scott webb and mr webb do you um swear to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth i do thank you thank you very much so uh welcome to the new members uh i'm sure you'll see me up here again as the years go by <laughs> it's been a couple decades so far, so uh, I'm here again. Um, so uh, you guys have gotten way deep into uh, to a lot of stuff here tonight in uh, what is hopefully a relatively simple case. I'm going to try to just bring it back a little bit here for you. So uh, big picture stuff here. Uh, this is admittedly an incongruous house for the mile square. This was built, you know, 100 years after the rest of them, built probably in the 50s and the 60s as a ranch. You know, we probably wouldn't even allow something like this you know in the historic district at the time nonetheless it was built in the 50s and 60s and that's kind of what my client has purchased with regard to the uh, extra apartment up there um, a lot of houses that were built in that era in town it was very common for people to take in a border and to have a little kind of efficiency unit upstairs my first home that I bought on Silver Lane in the late 80s we had that in the upstairs when we bought it. There was just a tiny little kitchenette and you could perhaps take in a border. That's what was apparently happening here. Now, with regard to that, um, you know, there's a little bit of difference in classification. At the time that this building was built, that may have been something that was allowed. Right now, we're talking about it as a student rental and we're talking about rental permits and we're talking about classification as a two family. At the time, this may be not was maybe not required to be classified as a two-family just because you had a upstairs border. You had one student sleeping above your garage. You maybe didn't have to call it a two-family at the time. Now we do have to call it a two-family. Now because it is a student rental and it is existing, if we intend to use any other portion of this house or expand it to, you know, toward its highest and best use for the zoning district, then you know we need to classify this as a two-family and in order to do that we need to address this parking question so with regard to the highest and best use and what we're trying to accomplish here um, as Zach pointed out this is an R3 zoning district uh, it's currently a single family the lot meets all of the requirements for a higher use the lot is large we meet lot coverage we meet all of these other questions about it so turning it into a two-family would be desirable, both from a policy standpoint. This is an area where Planning Commission and City Council has targeted to increase density, and that's what we would be attempting to do here, make this building legit, do some improvements to the building. But as Zach pointed out, until we know that we can proceed in that realm, that's why we're here, hopefully, just to talk about this driveway. Um, so <clears throat> the practical difficulty, then, is you know, what is standing in our way of being able to achieve this next best use? And it comes down simply to parking. And one thing that I wanna make sure that we all understand here is that we're not talking about whether somebody can park there, okay? They can. There's is a two car garage with a two car garage door and a two car wide driveway. They're allowed to park there. The question at hand is whether we can count that as the space, not whether it is a space, not whether we can pave it, not whether we need to tear it back up if you guys vote no it's just simply whether we can count it um, so we're not asking to put in any more paving we're not asking to increase lot coverage we're not asking for anything other than to let us just count the spaces that we have it's a it is a it's a zoning thing and, and in, in my opinion when we talk about the spirit and intent of that particular provision in the mile square in particular as I said, this is an incongruous building type. We don't build two-car garages in the mile square. They didn't 100 years ago, and we really don't do it now. So, um, so you know, the, that is a, um, so a lot of the intent, in my opinion, of this zoning provision has to do with 
new construction, that we don't want two car garages. We, that's why we have a, a driveway width minimum in the mile square that's different perhaps from the neighborhoods that you live in. We don't limit the, we don't stop you from having a two car wide driveway elsewhere in the city, but in the mile square. But that's more of a, in my opinion, that's about new construction. And likewise, the practical difficulty would be a different question at that point too. If I were in here asking for a double wide driveway and new construction, the question would be simple. Is there another way you could do this, Scott? If I got a bare land, I have to say, yeah, there's probably another way I could do this. In the case at hand here, where we're talking about uh, an adaptive reuse or uh, an alteration to a building as opposed to new construction, then the practical difficulty, I think, is clear. You know, to literally say we cannot, you know, improve this property, we cannot take it to a use that would be allowed by every other measure of the zoning code because we're not allowed to count a parking space that we already have and will continue to have and continue to use. So that's kind of where, uh, where we feel we are on this. Um, so again, I think uh, you know, we appreciate your, uh, your thoughtful questions and, and digging into this. And uh, you know, there are important things to consider here for sure. Um, uh, the intention uh, for this uh, is to potentially expand that upstairs apartment the attic is huge across the entire thing. You can stand up in three quarters of it up there. So we're investigating some ideas of, of uh, turning that from what was likely an efficiency for a single person, a border, so to speak, to live in, actually in turning it into some kind of a larger apartment at some point. Um, but you know, when we do that, it'll be internal, maybe a dormer. You know, we're not intending to change the footprint or move anything around. We're not tearing anything down. The garage will remain the garage. Um, with regard to the, uh, the practical, the practicality of a two-car garage for student housing, you are absolutely right, Mr. Wyatt. It's complicated. I, my office is in the mile square, whether they're in the garage or they're parking behind it. These kids are shuffling cars all the time. The good thing is, at, here at North Campus, we're just a couple blocks from campus, Ideally, they don't take their car at all. You know, I mean, right now people pay to store their cars on Miami lots, down at Millette Hall or down by the, the security office or whatever, because you don't really need it every day if you live close to campus. So, you know, hopefully the cars that are in the garage will stay there. If not, that's the student's problem to, uh, you know, just like when your wife parks behind you, you gotta sometimes uh, jockey some stuff around and, and it's, it's, a, it's a problem, but, uh, exists everywhere. So other than that, I'd be uh, happy to answer any questions. We certainly would appreciate your consideration and the ability to uh, invest some more in this property and, uh, and move us forward. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, any questions for Mr. Webb? Thank you. Yes. Mr. Webb, uh, could you help me out with this concept of highest and best use? Where's that coming from? Uh, constitutional property rights. Um, okay. That, you know, when you are, you, that is the, Constitutional property rights, the basis of investment and, and uh, part of our capitalist system is that you have the ability to improve your property to the highest and best use that zoning allows. Zoning sets limits on what you can do for the reasons that are obvious. We don't want a six family in this neighborhood, limit it to three family. Three family is the highest and best allowable use. It is the right of a property owner to try to get toward that sure. and their choice. So are you talking about a taking? Are you talking about the concept of a taking? I'm not familiar with that. Okay, well, you mentioned the Constitution. It's, I'm a lawyer. The only thing I understand about this is, and I'm not a zoning law expert, but if the city was to deny the variance, you could possibly argue that we are we're taking your property. We're doing something to, as you say, inhibit your highest and best use. But sure. I don't believe there's any requirements under our code or under Duncan that mandates us to give you a highest and best use. Is that accurate? Well, I don't know if that's accurate or not. I'm okay. not a lawyer, but uh, but I do. I am familiar yeah, I with ask the Duncan the standards. Law director, he knows. I am familiar with the Duncan standards and and the you know the decision standards by which we're making our application. Just want to have a good record. That's yeah. So there, there's there's <clears throat> as has already been mentioned. You're you're right, uh, sir. Uh, there, there are property rights, as the applicant has mentioned. Um, property rights are enshrined in the USA and the Ohio Constitution. Uh, there's case law that supports property rights. Um, you know, your decision as a BZA is, is focused on this applicant, this property, their specific request for a variance uh, based upon Oxford 
ordinances and code, and specifically the Duncan standards, which are not just uh, an Ohio Supreme Court case, but also enshrined in Oxford's own code as well. So um, really, those are the standards that you're relying upon and whether or not you choose to grant uh, this variance or, or deny it. My question is, though, if, if we deny the variance, would we be in jeopardy of being accused of taking? We've already established that there's uh, beneficial use that's this property as is. Is that correct? Um, you know, so without going too too deep into this, there 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 are appeal rights. So you know, you're a quasi judicial body. So what that means is, um, you know, if you deny um, an applicant, just in general, right? If you deny an applicant their request for a variance, they have appeal rights. So they can go ahead and file what's called a 2506 appeal. It goes typically to the Court of Common Pleas in Butler County, and then they can challenge your decision. Um, and typically what a court will look at is whether or not your decision to deny the variance is supported by the reliable probative evidence in the record. And again, you know, the reliable probative evidence in the record is everything that you've heard from the applicant, that you've heard from Mr. Moore, and, um, and any, any exhibits that you've accepted or PowerPoint slides in the staff report. So you want to you know, make any decision you make today based upon the evidence that you heard, either in favor or, or against granting the variance. And uh, you know, ultimately when you have a deliberation uh, here shortly, you'll want to talk about the evidence that you heard, which factors you think support right, the applicant or do not support the applicant's request for a variance. And then ultimately, you know, depending upon which direction you go in your vote, you're going to want to cite the specific factors Right, that you relied upon in making your decision. All right, so um, so this is you know this is a quasi judicial body, and um, you're making a an important decision to the applicant that the applicant has constitutional rights to go ahead under the higher vice code to challenge if they if they disagree with it. One more question, Mr. Webb. Uh, the section that's involved here, uh, Code 1149.06b1. Uh, did you reference that in terms of how you interpreted it with respect to this property? Did you reference that? Is that the section you were talking about. I mean, that's the variance I'm applying. It's yeah, the it's code. the section that section basically for keeps which I'm this for guy from going from a single family to a two family because he doesn't have enough parking space. Is that correct? Say that again. This section would prevent your client from converting the property from a single family use to a double family use because he doesn't meet the parking requirements, correct? Potentially, yeah. That's 114906B1, right? I okay. believe so. Now, I'm trying to figure out why there's a policy like that. And one of, one of the things just popped into my head, could it be that the zoning gods who set this thing up, city council or whoever, or the Supreme Court, decided maybe this could be useful in preventing conversions of properties from single family to double family? Is that possible? Well, I guess anything is possible to try to, uh, you know, imagine the, the, uh, the impetus of a, of a sure. law from... It, it could be a good <laughs> policy. It could be a good policy. And, Shouldn't we consider that? Well, I think you should consider the Duncan standards and uh, not policy of, about whether or not you believe we should have a two-family here. I don't think that's one of your decision standards. But, but Mr. Webb, would you agree that enforcing the law is important? I'm sure you do, right? Well, yes, yeah. that's, and and this that's is why a law we have right a board of zoning of Eleven forty-nine zero six b one is the law. It is the law, and okay. and also I don't know the section, but the entire chapter in our zoning code about the Board of Zoning Appeals says that yes, this is the rules, yes, there are exceptions, this is the body that gets to deliberate those exceptions. So gotcha. that is also law as much as no exceptions is law, exceptions are also law. Thank you very much, sir. Can I just add one, if, one thing if you're, if you're okay with it, just to help illustrate. So, you know, just so I think everybody understands this, but obviously, you know, when a, an applicant comes before you, they're asking for uh, variance to the law, right? So you're considering this to determine whether or not they have, you know, met enough of the Duncan criteria to grant them a, a deviation, right, from from the law. So just you know, keep that in mind as well. Just as, as a general pointer, you know, when you're considering any application. Of course. Any other questions for the applicant? Okay. Hearing none, I think at this point we should enter into deliberation as a board. If there's no public comment. Okay. Is that? Shall we end regular session? Is that needed, or we just go into deliberation? So I would end. Um, I would. I would make a motion. Uh, somebody should make a motion to close. Okay. Um, right. uh, the adjudication process and enter into discussion, and then you can just do a second and voice vote. Okay. I'll make a motion to close and enter into deliberation. A second. 
a second. And voice press. Yep. Yeah. So moved. Okay. Well, we are now in deliberation. So if we want to talk openly about the case. Me, like, you want me to say something? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're not a legislative body. Right. And we have no scope whatsoever. Our scope is to interpret these rules, and I'm glad we had the Duncan rule because it, it clarifies a lot of things. Um, so I personally see absolutely no reason not to approve this um, for some obvious reasons. Number one, there's, it, it, you're not pouring any more concrete. You're not doing anything else to the property. You're proving a space that's already there. The lot, seeing it, it's large enough. It's not going to look out of place. Yep. Um, so that's my opinion. Yeah, I tend to agree with that. I think you know there's no new construction here. There's there's simply just a uh, sort of a reclassification in a sense. So I I don't see anything wrong with it either. I agree with you guys. And I don't. I from my experience, I don't think it's a taking. We're not taking the house to build a road no. or anything like that. Right. So, um, and it seems to me we're converting something that's already there. Right. That we're counting something that's that's already there. To your point. Right. Right. Yeah. In an effort to remain in our lane as board of zoning and appeals, I think we move forward with this. I'll just go with the record. I, I don't support it because there's just been no evidence to show what this predicament is, what the significant costs are. It's been speculation as to what it might cost. Now. There's reasonable return on the investment right now as it stands. It's been being used as a multifamily apartment since 93, as far as we can tell, based on the sketch and the evidence. So um, it's just a parking concern, which I think it, it's not policy to say 114906B1 was put in there for a reason, mm -hmm. because we don't want eight cars, and that, that street is narrow and short. I mean, we all talked about it. We all have a concern about it. It's a legitimate concern in the zoning code. It just seems like maybe have parking just seems involved. like maybe a different conversation with different um, you know individuals that can make rulings and changes to policy and legislative matters, enforcement matters, and we're simply here to yeah. approve or deny a variance for a driveway that already exists. So, and then I think to to, our, to my earlier question, there's nothing stopping the current owner from parking eight cars there. Right. No. Or nine. But you got eight, eight occupants. You're gonna have more cars. Yeah. Or less, we don't know. <laughs> Some of these young kids like to walk. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we've recently seen it. so. <laughs> Good for their health. Do we have any other um, points to be made regarding this while we're in deliberation? Or yeah. okay, well, I would motion that we exit deliber deliberation back to regular meeting, um, so we can move forward with this case. Second. <coughs> okay, so moved. We're now back in regular session. Um, anyone have a motion? regarding this particular case. The motion, I guess, would be to approve or deny um, BZA 2024-02, uh, the variance to section 1149.06B1. I make a motion to approve. Okay. Second it. Third. So moved. So now that you have a second, you can do a roll call vote. Okay. Um, and, and voting on okay. the motion to approve. Okay. Sorry, we'll go ahead and do a roll call with a second vote. Uh, thank you, Zach. Uh, so um, I would encourage you, when you make a motion, to support or deny, cite the criteria ah, that you believe, yeah. and you can look at the specific criteria, the criteria that you believe, in this case, supports your decision to uh, grant the variance, right? Okay. Does that make sense? It does. You can just you can just read it. Which which criteria specifically? Thank you. And you don't have to cite them all. You know, I would cite the ones that are obviously in favor. Sure. Okay. So we we have a motion on the floor. Who made the motion? We made the motion. Okay. And do you would you like to support that motion based on any particular criteria? Mm -hmm. Criterion. Right. Well, it meets almost all the criteria. So. On the computer here. <laughs> so. Uh, the criteria B, which supports uh, whether the, vari uh, the variance is substantial. Uh, that is, uh, I support that, uh, the recommendation for that. Um, I support um, criteria C, whether the essential character of the neighborhood would be substantially altered or whether adjoining properties would suffer a substantial detriment as a result of the variance. It would not. I, I agree with that. Um, 
And uh, do you want me to, to list all the criteria? Well, you, you, or so you, I can summarize after the motion if that, or. You don't have to list them all and then you know when you do list them in general, you could just say which, you can even say criteria on D, criteria on E, criteria. Right. Okay. Which I, and I'm just obviously picking one. Right, the criteria would be criteria C, uh, criteria uh, D, uh, criteria F, criteria G, and criterion H. So the motion that's, <clears throat> that's been proposed is to accept um, the variance, except, except um, the variance section, to, variance to section um, 1149.06B1 based on the criteria of B, C, D, F, G, and H. Um, it's currently on the, on the board. It's been, has been motioned. I second the motion. Now, now with two of those, uh, we would like to go to a roll call vote for the acceptance of that variance. Okay. I'll start with Mr. Dash Dorge. Uh, aye. Mr. Wyatt. Aye. Mr. Chaffin. No. And Mr. Smith. Aye. Yes. Okay, the motion um, carries and we've accepted the variance um, in, the, in this case. Uh, we now um, have no further business, and we can adjourn the meeting. Move to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Aye. So moved. Adjourned at 739.